Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Lou Blank from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a graduate student in UW's La Follette School of Public Affairs, and I'm earning a certificate in energy analysis and policy from the Nelson Institute of Environmental Studies. I'm also a project assistant for one of our speakers today, Professor Morgan Edwards. I'm pleased to introduce both Morgan and Professor Greg Nemet, who will be speaking today about their current work on climate solutions. From technologies like solar panels and heat pumps to policies to accelerate the transition to a clean energy economy. As floods, droughts, fires, and heat waves make the impacts of climate change increasingly dire, these innovative solutions are crucial to addressing climate change. I'd like to provide a brief background on both of our speakers. First, Morgan Edwards is an assistant, assistant professor at UW-Madison's La Follette School of Public Affairs. Her research and teaching focus on just energy responses to the climate crisis across policymaking scales. Current projects focus on understanding pathways for phasing out coal power plants and other fossil fuel infrastructure and assessing the equity implications of carbon dioxide removal and other novel climate mitigating technologies. She also teaches courses on evidence-based policymaking and cost-benefit analysis. Morgan received her PhD in engineering systems from MIT and before coming to Madison was a president's postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland. Greg Nemet is a professor at UW-Madison's La Follette School of Public Affairs. His research focuses on understanding the process of technological change and the ways in which public policy can affect it. He also teaches courses in energy systems analysis, policy analysis, and international environmental policy. Greg's first book, How Solar Became Cheap, a model for low carbon innovation, a book I've personally read and would highly recommend, was published in 2019 and makes the case that by understanding the drivers behind solar energy's success, other low carbon technologies with similar properties can benefit. Greg received his doctorate in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley, and serves as a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report, which will be released by the United Nations in spring 2022. Please welcome Professors Morgan Edwards and Greg Nemet. Great, thanks Lou, thanks Badger Talks. It's really nice to do this uh, discussion, this presentation in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Edwards. And what I'd like to do is just talk about uh, three interrelated items, policy, technology, and the climate. And this little graphic at the bottom of my slides here is meant to illustrate kind of the, the dynamics that really underscore all of the work that, that I do, which is that policy can make, can lead to improvements and in innovation and technologies. That's the state capital dome there to the light bulb, that there's a feedback effect as you have better technologies, more affordable technologies, that changes the politics. It allows things to happen. It creates new interest groups and it allows new coalitions to get behind climate change. And if you get that dynamic into a positive feedback where each side strengthens the other, the technology improves, that increases the politics, that leads to better funding and support and expectations, that all of that can have uh, improvements on, on the climate. And so that's, that's the dynamic I wanna explore a little bit. And so I wanna just mention just briefly a few items on each of these three areas, on the climate, on the technology, and on the policy. So first of all, on the climate, so Lou will be familiar with this slide that I talk about in my energy analysis course, but basically the issue here is that we've got too much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that's that red squiggly arrow of heat going back to the earth on the right-hand side there. And so that, uh, that greenhouse ga gas effect, which we need some of, so that the temperature of the earth is not like the moon, we need some of it to make it habitable, but we have too much now and that's been accumulating over time. And that's the, that's the problem we're dealing with. Last week, some of you may have heard that the UN's scientific body to provide information to the UN climate talks called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, released a report talking about climate change science. And so this was a seven year process of understanding what all the science had been done in the last seven years, what's new since the last report and talking about the impacts on the climate. And so, I work on this uh, in this body too, and I'll be uh, releasing our work in March on the solutions part of it. But the, the part that came out last week was about what uh, what's happening with the climate itself. And so some of the highlights, I actually really enjoyed 
the chance to talk about some of this and to dig into that important and say, well, what are the new or important things? And so I think these are some of the, the main ones that have come up. So one is they say that widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, that's ice and biosphere have occurred. Unequivocal human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. That's a stronger claim that's been made than has been made in prior reports. And so I think that's an important one uh, to pay attention to. Human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. And then one thing you can see is that how much of this is new. So we're talking about now 1.1 degrees of warming. We're concerned about getting up to 1.5 or two in the next few decades, and then possibly uh, beyond that. But you can see if you look backwards at temperature records, at things like tree rings and other indicators of temperature over a long period of time, we're way above uh, where the average has been. And so this is to substantiate that claim on the left there that the climate uh, really is changing. And I would say, you know, one thing for people that work on climate is there's not that much new here, like some of the parameters and the values are slightly different. Um, but the confidence has increased in terms, especially in terms of the human attribution. And I think that is going to provide a lot of support going forward about uh, removing some of the uncertainty that was kind of been there about what the other factors might have been. There's really no uncertainty now that the climate is changing and that it's due to humans. And then if we start to think about where some of the uncertainty really is, it's in the smaller scale, more resolved impacts. One thing that I thought was interesting is that if you look at these are world regions, that's supposed to be a world map there in this highly aggregated uh, way that the climate models work here. If you look at Central North America, that's us uh, and where that arrow is pointing to, that's one of the biggest impacts for heavy precipitation and the second highest confidence in the world um, that that's where the biggest impact is. And so that's something that I think a lot of us have experienced in the last few years of noticing, wow, that's a lot of flooding events and heavy rain events. And that is getting picked up in the climate science uh, as well. And, and we're kind of a bit of an outlier in terms of that being the biggest impact for us uh, around here. Okay, so that's just a minute on the science. Here's where the governance and policy issues come in and why it's such a hard problem. And this is a sentence that I kind of build my whole class on global environmental governance around is here's the challenge. How should societies address a truly public goods, a truly global public goods program problem with deep uncertainty about how bad it will be, that's the impacts, and how hard it will be to do something about it. Those are the costs to address all of it with diverse perspectives amongst the almost 8 billion people in the world today, or the 50 billion people that will be alive in the 21st century that really have different interests in terms of what they think about risks, which risks they most care about, how they think about the future versus the present, that's time preferences. And all of this needs to be sustained over several decades. It's not something that we uh, get done or get fixed in a year or two. So that's the challenge. And here's the miracle. And this is the Paris Agreement from December 2015. I just say that because I was in a meeting with the German lead negotiator the week after the Paris Agreement was signed and describing the process, and he really never believed this would actually happen. And it is truly is a miracle that it happened. And it's, it's certainly not sufficient for us to deal with climate change, but the world is in so much of a better place by having this agreement of having this bottom-up process that leads to countries being able to decide how they want to pursue this uh, increment or iterative process allows us to reset our targets and get more ambitious over time. But the bottom line is that all of these countries, including the US, agreed to limit warming to two degrees and make efforts to limit to 1.5. So we're already at 1.1. So there's not a lot of space to go um, to stay within the climate targets. And in terms of what that means for our CO2 emissions, the bottom line is that means getting pretty close to zero, depending on the target, depending on the pathway, in 20 to 30 to 40 years. So the top line is business as usual emissions. And it's not just about stopping emissions from rising. It's not about uh, incremental change or maybe having emissions. It's about getting to zero by mid century. And that's, that's the bottom line of all of these targets have that in common. So that's the challenge. And one of the things that I also uh, talk about, this is in the class that Lou took with me, is that uh, this is not going to be easy. And there's, there's kind of three reasons it's hard. So one is we want different things from energy systems. We want energy that's cheap, 
that's clean and that's reliable, but we disagree on which of those is most important. That's the first problem. Second is if we look at how transitions have occurred in the past, they've taken decades. So 70 years to go from a bio-based economy where wood was the main uh, source of energy to one where coal was king, then to oil being the main. Those are half century plus transitions. And we don't have that time based on the slide that I showed a couple of slides ago. So that's the other thing that makes it hard. The other thing that makes it unique and different from environmental problems that we've dealt with in the past is once we clean things up, nature can take care of them on their own. And within a few years or even weeks in the case of other pollutants, we're back to where we were. With CO2, we don't have that reversibility. We've got CO2 and when it goes up in the atmosphere, it stays for a hundred years. And so that's a big reason that we start to think about really rapid reductions and also about finding ways to maybe remove artificially CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So those are the reasons why dealing with climate change is hard. I, over time, realized that my students were, were, had absorbed those facts only too well, and they completely understood them, and thus were very discouraged about the problem. And that's uh, why I started asking myself and colleagues about why we continue to work on uh, this if it's hopeless, because I don't think it is, because there's reasons, and this is my list that I've developed over time. And over time, this list has gotten longer. Each of the items on the list has gotten more credible. And as I talk to other people, I realize they have different lists about what uh, is, is keeping them uh, optimistic about it. So, the, and the two that I'll talk about today, one is on technology getting better. So that's part of Professor Morgan's work and part of the work that I'll talk about in just a minute. And then two, this emerging collective action. That's the Paris Agreement I just talked about, and Professor Edwards will talk about that a bit as well. So that's, and another time I'll talk about the full list, but I think those top two are probably the really most important ones and they support some of the others on this list as well. So here's what's been happening is these technologies that used to be considered uh, not serious solutions, too expensive, too small, solar, that's the photovoltaics or PV, wind power, and then batteries for electric vehicles, all have this very steep trajectory of cost reductions to the point where solar and wind in a lot of places too are extremely cheap and they're beating fossil fuels without subsidies. And there's you know, other things that will be need to do, do to the electric grid to incorporate lots of these various renewables and similarly with electric vehicles need an infrastructure. But those are not impossible problems to solve and they're not that costly to do either. And so we really have a set of solutions that we didn't have 10 years ago um, that's making a lot of this much more possible than it was before. And so a lot of my work is looking at how we could do more of that. And my thinking is that if we look at what's worked in the past, that gives us some indications of what we could do in the future. And so if we look at solar, there's a few things I would say about the solar story. First is that it's been a long-term process. So something like 60 or 70 years to get the price of solar down, but it's come down a lot. So that 10 to the negative fourth, that's a factor of 10,000 from the cost of solar on the first commercial application, which was on the Vanguard One satellites in the 1950s to today, where we have power purchase agreements of below $20 per megawatt for electricity from solar. There's been various policies along the way. No one country did it. You can see the different flags on this slide. It's been really an international flow of knowledge around the world. And that's really what's happened, that each of these countries has contributed something distinct based on their unique national innovation system and has left us with this tool for addressing climate change that could really address a big part of the problem. And we are seeing something similar, exactly similar today on batteries for electric vehicles. And we've seen something on wind and there are other technologies going this way as well. So this is really exciting and understanding some of the policy levers behind it, I think is gonna be helpful for making good decisions uh, in the future. And so this is sort of what my work is meant to do is to see how we might accelerate and do this for other technologies. And just the just to give a sense on the rows here of this slide, technology push, so that's funding science, but especially training people. So we have more scientists and engineers and others. Public procurement is about governments buying new technologies when they're still risky and expensive and getting them to scale as a result of those purchases. We've done that really well for a change as well. Knowledge flows has been crucial for getting knowledge out of people's heads into data sets, into documents so that other people can use it 
and the global mobility of people and ideas and machines and equipment around the world has been crucial for a bunch of these technologies, really clearly in the case of solar and batteries as well. And then finally on markets on demand so that what really matters once you get a technology starting to work and starting to be able to be used is having markets that are strong, that are growing. There's expectations that there will be a market in the future that leads to new production processes. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it can change the political economy so that it's not just about this novel technology trying to fight against an entrenched technology with a lot of political support, is you start to have new sources of political support from the entities that can benefit from these technologies. And that's something that five or 10 years ago that was considered kind of speculative. Yeah, that could happen. But today it's really actually happening. You can really see it in who's lobbying, who the interest groups are and where employment is for sure. So that's this is kind of a playbook that comes out of some of this empirical work. So trying to put this together into what we need for kind of future climate policy. Here's a one sentence description is we need something comprehensive. So it's not just about one policy. It needs to be inclusive. So it's not just about one goal about reducing emissions, but it's about helping to create inclusive well-being for the 50 billion people that are going to be alive in the 21st century. And that it needs to be dynamic, that we may change our minds on what exactly we want. The tools might change. We might face new problems. And so we have to be somewhat flexible in designing and maintaining and implementing um, these policies. And a lot of it, I think, should be oriented towards stimulating innovation and accelerating adoption of these low carbon technologies. So that's kind of the policy uh, framework that I use going into, into some of my work. So here are some of the ideas that come out of that work. So first of all, and I've, I've said a couple of these things, we've seen major progress in low carbon technologies and combine that with information and communications technologies, some people call digitalization. That's really making things go faster. It's providing new services. And I'll mention this in a minute. There could be something that's smaller is faster and faster is important for the climate. So that's an important one to, to take a look at and consider that these improved technologies are making the low carbon transition more feasible and more affordable. So that it's now realistic to think about peaking our emissions maybe within in the next couple of years, rapidly declining to zero over the next couple of decades. And that some of these dynamic technologies, solar, wind, batteries for electric vehicles, all connected with digitalization, that's not the whole story. We'll need other things as well, but they can do a big part of it. And those are tools that we really didn't have. You really couldn't say that those were affordable and feasible uh, even 10 years ago. But even if these technologies are there and they're more affordable now, we still need policy. There's this pollution externality that creates a need for government. There's knowledge spillovers where people have incentives to reverse engineer. And so we need to simulate investment. And there's innovation system perspectives that show that we need broad support or across a variety of policies. And then finally, we should be designing policy with technology dynamics in mind. So thinking about these technologies getting better. It's not just the ones that we have today. It's not just about trying to figure out what's the most uh, low cost incremental change. It's about this bigger change that we need and that might need a more comprehensive mix. Sometimes it's called industrial policy. What I think we need a lot more of are people like Lou and others that are getting trained in public policy, but also trained in energy systems and climate and other aspects will be relevant to the problem um, so that governments can make better decisions and really um, help steer, steer the direction of this, of this transition. I, I just can't help put a couple of data points up here uh, about this is the smallest, faster idea. And you know, there's a few, these are the units that are produced uh, for each of these technologies. So PV for solar panels, we've had almost 4 billion, billion solar panels today on the similar level of millions of wind turbines, so a thousand times fewer, and the nuclear power is a thousand times fewer than that, so a little bit less than a thousand nuclear power plants. And there's something about this small scale iterative aspect, having done this 4 billion times in the case of making solar panels, that has allowed for rapid adoption and rapid learning. And learning in the energy technology sense means um, improving the technology or reducing the cost. And so there's something about small that's faster. And so it could turn out, and this is the opposite of what I was learning in, in graduate school, is that small scale technologies may turn out to be more scalable, like contribute to a big way to this big problem um, than large ones, which seem to have a really hard time getting started uh, and getting the cost down. So that's something. So where I come out on that is that we should be putting focusing our policy effort on 
dynamic technologies, ones that are improving. Small unit size seems to be something that is has a large payoff. This iterative improvement, make lots of them so we can get them better and cheaper. And then integrating them into a local environment is absolutely crucial. And that's going to take a lot of focus um, as well. And so part of this goes into this idea of dynamic industrial policy for climate change. And just to, to finish up here on a, on a few points with that, urgency and acceleration are goals. So if we need to get to zero by 2050, that means a much faster change than we've had in the past. We need multiple policies. It's not just one silver bullet policy. We need many, and we could probably strategically sequence them so that maybe the easier to adopt policies start first and then get to the harder ones later. Third, that government engages deeply in innovation. So when we talk about industrial policy, that's often what people are talking about. And if we look at some of the successes, like we talked about the solar case and batteries too, it's really been governments playing a big role in shaping expectations and enabling innovation to happen. That we need technology and inclusivity because ultimately we're gonna be talking about social acceptance of these technologies and any of them can get cut off and not end up contributing to the problem um, if we don't take these other concerns seriously as well. And so that's something that becomes an important, more important part of my work, I think it, it should be. And then that local learning is important. So think about how these technologies that might be produced globally and might think of it as dev devices that work well, more and more it's how they're integrated into the local system. So how do grids work when lots of people are producing solar on their roofs? How does the electric grid work when we have a charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, some of which may be serving as electric store? So that part is really where uh, the payoff is for making these improved technologies work even better. And that sixth, that we really need to be adaptive. We need to learn from what seems to have worked, try different things, and you know, accept that some of them will fail. Some of them will be technologies that don't go anywhere that were worth uh, trying. And some of them will be policies that maybe don't have the right uh, incentives behind them or lead to unintended consequences. And we're going to need to try some of those as well and then scale up the ones that do work. And so there is really a benefit in the US case of federalism that allows us to do this experimentation. So I will stop there and turn it over to Professor Edwards. And just wanted to mention that Professor Edwards and I are co-chairing the La Follette Forum on Climate Change on October 6th. So any of you who are more interested in learning uh, more about Professor Edwards' work and some of the stuff I've talked about, that'd be a great time to, to participate again. So I'll turn it over to you, Professor Edwards. All right, great. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today and speaking with you all as part of the Badger Talk series. So I'm Morgan Edwards, and I'm an assistant professor of climate policy at the La Follette School of Public Affairs. And I also lead the Climate Action Lab, which is a research group here at UW-Madison that focuses on modeling and tracking policy responses to the climate crisis. And the Climate Action Lab works with undergraduate school and across campus, including Lou Blank, who gave a wonderful introduction to this talk. So if you're a student watching and you're interested in climate action, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Now for this part of the talk, I'd like to begin by picking up on the second reason for optimism that Professor Mehmet mentioned earlier, and that's emerging collective action. So we heard earlier about the Paris Agreement, which is a new framework for collective climate action among countries. Uh, but over the past several years, we've also seen many other actors make climate commitments to help address the climate crisis. So these actors include city, state, and local governments, tribal nations, businesses, universities, faith organizations, and many others. And we're seeing this throughout the world, but let's take a look here at the United States. So this map shows actors in the US outside of the federal government that have committed to upholding the goals of the Paris Agreement. And you can see that there's a lot of them and that this momentum is growing. So we published this analysis in 2020, um, and that at that time, state and local governments with climate commitments represented 71% of US gross domestic product, 68% of the population, and over half of total emissions. Um, so this group of state and local climate actors, uh, which includes us here in Wisconsin, is globally significant. And if it were its own country, 
it would have the second largest GDP after the entire US. So why are we seeing these commitments now? I think there are three main reasons. The first, and you heard about this from Professor Nemet, um, is that the costs of low carbon technologies are declining. So where wind or solar energy might have been too expensive previously, the incremental cost over say a new natural gas plant um, is a lot lower now. Uh, and in some cases, renewable energy is actually the cheapest option. The second reason is climate mobilization, where people throughout the country are increasingly pushing for climate action. And I think this is partially because more and more people are seeing the effects of climate change in their own backyards. Um, but a lot of this mobilization is also driven by young people and especially youth of color. And finally, we're seeing climate policy proposals that are more deeply connected to the things that we care about as a society. So things like racial and economic justice, public health, infrastructure, and green jobs. Um, and research suggests that these interconnected policies get more public support than policies that just focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we're seeing this emerging collective action, uh, but as researchers who work on evidence-based policymaking, an important question to ask is, what could it all add up to? And it turns out that this is a complicated question. So these actions can overlap. So you might have a city taking action within a state that also has a climate policy, and maybe there's a business in that city um, that also has made a climate commitment. So when you're adding these contributions up, you need to avoid double counting. And different types of actions can also affect one another. So the benefits of switching to an electric car um, increase as your electric utility transitions to renewable energy. So we added all this up across the US. And what we found was that current policies on the books had the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by around 25% by 2030, relative to 2005 levels. And that by taking a small set of ambitious but realistic actions, state and local governments could bring these reductions to 37%. And then finally, if we layer on national climate policies, we could get to an almost 50% reduction which is in line with President Biden's goal of 50 to 52% by 2030, by 20, yeah, 30. Um, and it also would put us on a roughly linear path uh, to a goal of net zero emissions by 2050. So this is a big reduction, uh, but how do we get there? Well, there are three main pillars. And the first is to accelerate towards 100% clean electricity. So this means replacing fossil fuels like coal and natural gas with low carbon electricity sources like wind and solar. And the second is to decarbonize end uses in buildings, transportation, and industry. Um, and the main way that we do this is to convert technologies that run on fossil fuels to run on electricity. So replacing a gasoline car with an electric car um, or a gas furnace with a heat pump. And then the third, is to enhance carbon storage in our forests, farms, and other ecosystems throughout the country. And we can work on all of these, uh, but in the near, near term, so over the next decade or so, our models suggest that most emissions reductions, so around 70%, um, will come from transitioning towards 100% clean electricity, so that first pillar. And that's important because the cleaner that our electric grid gets, uh, the bigger the benefits of electrifying other end uses. But that doesn't mean that we don't need policies to address other sectors. Um, and some of these sectors will be harder to transition than electricity because they're more decentralized. Um, so think about making changes to all the cars on the road or all the homes across the country. Um, so it's important that we get started now. And one example of a place where we're already getting started uh, is leaky natural gas systems. So natural gas is a fossil fuel um, and we use it in lots of ways in our energy system. So we burn it in power plants to generate electricity and we also use it directly in our buildings, industry and in some vehicles. 
Um, and natural gas is also the main way that we heat our homes in the US, especially for climates like here in Wisconsin. And this gas gets delivered through miles and miles of underground pipelines. Um, and these pipelines can leak. So this is particularly true in older cities on the East Coast, like New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, DC. So this map shows gas leaks and repaired in a portion of the state of Massachusetts over a one year period. And you can also use the link or the QR code here to check out an interactive version of this map on the Climate Action Lab website. Uh, and the largest pump of the leaks you see here is around the city of Boston, where around 300,000 metric tons of natural gas leak out of aging pipelines every year. And this number is kind of hard to wrap your head around. So in economic terms, the lost gas is conservatively worth around $90 million. And in energy terms, it could provide heat for 200,000 homes. But these leaks are also concerning from a climate perspective because methane, the primary component of natural gas, is a potent greenhouse gas. And in fact, it's the largest contributor to climate change after carbon dioxide. So when natural gas leaks into the atmosphere, it's also warming the planet. And so addressing these leaks is an important lever for near-term climate action. And we can design policies to address gas leaks at many different levels um, and at different stages of the supply chain, but I'll focus here on state and local policy. And Massachusetts was an early actor in this area. So in response to new science showing the extent of the problem, and strong community engagement, Massachusetts has passed a series of laws directing gas utilities to report leaks publicly and to fix the largest leaks. Now that's a big win um, and it's also just the start of the process. So our lab has been working with community successful these policies are on the ground. And to do that, we analyzed and mapped thousands of utility leak and repair records over a five year period. And what we found was that about 80% of repairs were potentially successful, but around 20% failed. So meaning that a new leak was detected after a repair occurred. And these failures represent almost 10,000 repairs. And that's a lot of wasted resources. So to dig up a road, perform a repair, repave, and so on. Uh, and we also triangulated these results by collecting data in the field. So this graph shows measurements that we took before and after repair for a sample of high emitting leaks. So leaks that are, we're most concerned about uh, for climate policy. And you can see that some repairs in gray totally eliminated the leak. Um, and some others in yellow didn't eliminate the leak, but they reduced the leak size to below the threshold for significant climate impacts. And then some leaks in orange still showed a significant leak even after repair. And some of these results you know, highlight the importance of collecting evidence throughout the climate policy life cycle. So it's important to look at state and local climate commitments and how these commitments could potentially reduce emissions. But it's also important uh, to evaluate how effective these commitments actually are on the ground. And what we found is that for this particular policy, um, the climate action was partially successful, but there's also room for improvement. And this is where qualitative research is really important. So we interviewed actors on the ground to identify a set of practices that can increase repair success. So things like verifying repairs after they occur, conducting spot checks for repairs, and creating policy mechanisms that reward utilities when repairs are successful. But we also found that even though some repairs fail, repairing leaks is still more cost effective than building new pipelines. And our results also highlighted the importance of data transparency. So this analysis wouldn't have been possible if Massachusetts hadn't passed a law requiring utilities to share their data publicly. And this kind of transparency can really help provide evidence about the effects of climate actions and ultimately design smarter climate policy. But repair failures also highlight the benefits of transitioning off gas and electrifying home heating. And one technology for electrifying home heating is heat pumps. So 
So heat pumps use electricity to move heat from outdoor to indoor air. So they're like an air conditioner that can run in reverse. And since they're moving heat around rather than generating heat by say burning gas, uh, that makes them very efficient. And it also means that they can provide heating in uh, the winter and cooling in the summer. And heat pumps are a growing source of home heating. So about 10% of US households use them, but their costs and benefits depend a lot on where you live. So they're more affordable in milder climates and can be more costly in cold climates. So in my lab, we're working to understand where heat pumps are being adopted in the US and implications for energy justice. So energy justice is a critical part of addressing the climate crisis. And one key element, which we call distributive justice, focuses on whether the costs of energy use like pollution and the benefits like new energy technologies or green jobs are equitably distributed. Um, and research shows that this often hasn't been the case, including for technologies like rooftop solar. And our work is suggesting that there may also be distributive injustices in heat pump adoption. But there are also opportunities to course correct um, and new policies in many states are focusing on ways to equitably pilot new heating technologies in disadvantaged communities. And this kind of investment can be a form of restorative justice. And as just one example, um, students in my cost benefit analysis class this fall will be looking at the costs and benefits of heat pumps for low income homes in Wisconsin. So zooming back out, uh, two big takeaways for me from this research are first, that local and national climate action both matter a lot. And that the best way to address the climate crisis is to design smart policies at all levels of government. And this means that if you're worried about the climate crisis and want to get involved, there are lots of places to start. And my second takeaway is that it's important to track climate goals and to look at policy outcomes. So this is something that I do as a researcher, often in collaboration with communities. And there are lots of ways that you can get involved too. So whether it's using low cost sensors to monitor air pollution or pushing for more data to be publicly available and accessible, uh, or just staying politically engaged even after a splashy policy announce announcement. And I'd like to end by noting that what we talked about today is just a small piece of all the exciting climate action research that's ha happening here on campus. And if you're interested in learning more about climate policy here in Wisconsin, you can join us on October 6th for the LaFollette Climate Policy Forum. So it's free to attend in person or online, and we hope to see you there. Greg and Morgan, thanks so much for sharing uh, all of this important work that you're doing. And I, I, I'm sure our viewers are sort of getting the same information in the sense that it we appreciate like the great research that you're doing and then you realize which policies will try to impact some solutions and then it's like herding cats right and then you come back and try to establish how effective the policy was and did it did people actually follow the policy so wow uh really appreciate this great work and i'm sure um part of your job also that come along as controversial in nature when so much is science based here and we do have some questions in the chat um, and hello everybody fran paleo moyer badger talks producer thanks for joining us today uh, so dan york posts a comment and a question great story on advances that got us cheap solar and policy solutions so an important and parallel story on how energy efficient technologies have advanced driven by both policies, programs, and markets. We can't get to GHG reductions by renewables alone. We need aggressive energy efficient policies and advances in tandem. So his, he follows up with the question, what do you see as the role of energy efficiency in getting us to low, no carbon energy economy? Yeah, I mean, I could start with that one just because it's off the top of my head. I was in uh, Germany last week meeting with colleagues and. One of the things we were doing was, you know, ideas for a new project that we started a, a few months ago on just what Dan York just asked about, which was how do we stimulate more energy efficiency and what are the policies that it would take for that? And I guess just a couple of things I would say is, you know, one part of the justification for energy efficiency, one is it can reduce emissions on its own, that, that can be helpful. Um, but two, 
all of these technologies, even ones that are apparently pretty benign, like solar, do have impacts. They take land, they take resources. And you know, the extent to which we can uh, use less energy through efficiency can reduce some of the, the negative impacts of even these solutions that we are way better than, say, burning fossil fuels. So I think that's the, the second reason for doing energy efficiency is to take away some of the adverse impacts of doing some of these other technologies at really large scale. And one of the things that, uh, as we investigate how to understand innovation and policy to support more innovation and use of energy efficiency, is to think that there are these kind of technological innovations that seem to be really uh, important, like we can think of LED lighting as a really important one. But there's also social innovations. And, you know, one thing that's great about working uh, in a policy school like Professor Edwards and I do is you learn from your colleagues. And one of the things that's come out of colleagues that do research on, on health and nutrition are, are the role of peer effects and understanding how, you know, once one person's behavior can affect someone else's behavior and interventions can kind of stimulate that uh, increasing process. And it seems to be similar on energy saving activities as, as one person does it. If you can talk to a neighbor, it reduces the risk. It gives you a source of reliable information and we see it in the data. So if we look at adoption of technologies, whether it's uh, energy efficiency devices or solar, that they tend to spread um, because of word of mouth and, and peer effects. So I think there's some exciting work that we're working on and I agree with Dan York it's a really important area um, to add to the to the set of solutions. Great thank and you. These solutions really complement each other too so the more we can invest in energy efficiency uh, it somewhat reduces the pressure to expand renewable energy because you have less energy demand so the so it's really an important part of the solution and it's also one that has multiple other societal benefits. So you can save money. Um, this can be especially important for lower income households who are really burdened by electricity bills. So investing in weatherization of those buildings can bring multiple different policy benefits. Great, thank you. And can you address that individual uh, efforts question? Obviously, um, everybody who is listening wants to know, can they make a change? Can they can they make an impact? And we were just having a discussion before we went live today. And our producer is asking, what, what can I do? How do, we, how do we make a difference? Can you talk about that? And are there resources that the average person can access that can tell us how to better behave, for lack of a better word? For me, it's kind of a three-part um, approach with individual action. So one, it's not sufficient, but I do think it's helpful and maybe necessary is for you know people to think about their behavior and their uh, what they do, and it maybe relates to Dan York's question about energy efficiency. And so, you know, one thing that pandemic has taught me is how to avoid doing as much air travel. That was by far the biggest source of my own carbon footprint, and I don't want to have as big a carbon footprint in the future as I had before the pandemic. And now there are some tools that that make it work. So. Um, part of it, I do think, is, is making smart decisions and, and personal behavior, um, but it's not sufficient. And I think a second leg of it is the political process. And I think people need to think about that as something that they can affect as well. And one simple way is by voting, but there's other ways that are potentially more impactful, um, such as you know writing to your representatives or meeting with your neighbors or becoming a, an activist and, and getting mobilized. And there's lots of mobilized interests out there. A lot of them are you know, defending the status quo, but increasingly there's really important movements. Professor Edwards mentioned some of them, especially on the, on the youth side that uh, can make a change as well. And so that's, that's the second part I think that everyone can and should get involved in. And third is, um, is just finding ways to use your, your talents and motivations. The climate change problem is such a big one that there are so many opportunities. It's not just about people trying to literally come up with a better light bulb, um, but it's, it's things like uh, communications and marketing, art and humanities has a role to play as well. And so I think there's so many opportunities to, to involve. And so it's just a finding a, it's almost or think about what you're good at, what you like doing, and then finding a way to connect that uh, with the climate problem. Yeah, I would agree with those three components and also just mention that you know, there's no price of admission to being involved in climate action. So I think sometimes 
individual action is used as a way to gatekeep certain communities from being. So here in Madison, you know, I, I can bike to work. It's really easy. We have really great biking infrastructure. Someone in a more rural community, you might need to drive to work and there's no way around that. So that doesn't mean just because not everyone is taking the same kinds of actions at the individual level, doesn't mean they can't contribute to the same conversation at a collective level. Great points. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat, which we won't be able to get to all of them today, but we will ask uh, Morgan and Greg to log on to our social media channel to address those questions after the talk, if you both be so kind to do that. Uh, another question comes in from Mickey Wilburn. Where do you see a gap where more passionate people are needed in the workforce in the next decade to make an impact? Do we need more scientists, researchers, policymakers, or industry tech workers? I think all of the above. And something that I'll also say, especially for you know, students now at the university, is that increasingly the distinctions between these er different areas are breaking down. So we're seeing that with big important policy problems, not just climate policy, but many others, we need people who can work at the interface of these different types of knowledge. So have some background in knowledge in science and the climate science, also have some understanding of the technology, but then really understand the policy process. So I think taking a really problem oriented view can be a nice way to think about um, you know, where you might fit into this conversation and then picking up the knowledge and skills that you need along the way. Thank you. Uh, Ann Schaefer posts a question. What do you think about the federal infrastructure bill and how will it help in the fight against climate change? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good start. There's a lot of important parts in that infrastructure bill relevant to climate change, especially in terms of modernizing the electric grid, uh, expanding charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then from my perspective, some of the smaller amounts, but potentially very high leverage um, components are on, on innovation. And there's about $20 billion in there for of the 1 trillion. So it's you know tiny, less than 1%. But it's, it's about stimulating demonstration projects for some of these areas um, that are not, don't already have the momentum. So wind, solar, batteries, electric vehicles, those are all getting going and some infrastructure will help. Um, but there's other technologies that we'll need such as dealing with emissions in agriculture and how we make fertilizer and how we make important basic materials like steel and cement that are not as amenable to switching to wind and solar and batteries right away. And so I think some of the efforts to do that are, are really important. And they set the stage for the bigger idea, which is the, the part of the, the budget reconciliation package that'll have to happen in the next five or six weeks if it's going to happen. Um, where we could have a much bigger set of budget implication uh, policies, um, such as you know requiring electric utilities to reduce their emissions or increase the amount of clean energy they use every year, and then have carrots and sticks to create incentives for that. So that that's the next step after the infrastructure bill that's um, that I think could really make a, a big difference here. And we've focused a lot of uh, what we've talked about so far on climate change mitigation. So that's the part of the puzzle uh, where you're reducing emissions and trying to limit the effects of climate change. But then a whole other pillar of climate policy focuses on climate adaptation and resilience. So that's how can our communities be better able to respond to the climate changes that we know are already baked in based on past emissions and what Professor Nemet mentioned about the long lifetimes of CO2. So there's a lot in the infrastructure bill too that could speak to some of these adaptation challenges. And there are interconnections between the two. So for example, uh, returning to investments in energy efficiency. So those can be really important for reducing energy demand and emissions, but they can also make homes more adaptable in times of extreme heat or cold. Well, Greg and Morgan, thank you so much for sharing all of your important work uh, with us today. and. Just know uh, everyone around the planet supports you and appreciates the work you're doing in one way or another, they do. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, please join us. We'll be back in two weeks as we continue the last of our La Follette School Focus Talks. Uh, on Tuesday, August 31st at noon, we're gonna be talking to Philip Collinger, who will be talking about 
the story our genes tell, and more specifically, how genes are linked with behavior, health, and socioeconomic status. Please visit us at badgertalks.wist.edu, where you can see the link to our new podcast, uh, which we did feature Greg Nemet most recently. So you'll see a link to that podcast on our website. See the upcoming schedule of live talks. Sign up for our email list. Please consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by a grant. And uh, you can also search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff that has signed up to give talks around the state to host groups. Uh, so please visit our website for any and all of that information. We'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks and thanks again for tuning in. Thank you.